Amen. Jonah is a famous story. We've all heard it probably since the time we were children, if we were raised in church. And I do expect all you children to pay attention. There's going to be a pop quiz after the sermon about Jonah, so I'm going to ask you some details. So you girls better pay attention, okay? And you boys too, you're not off the hook, young men. Okay, now Jonah, we know the story, generally speaking, that God sent this man. He said, go to this place. They're bad, and I want them to change. And Jonah didn't want to go. He thought he could run from the presence of the Lord. He gets on a ship. Then all of a sudden, God sends this tempestuous storm, and it's, I mean, they're going to go under. They're throwing things off. Meanwhile, he's sleeping under. They say, what meanest thou, O sleeper? They've cried unto their gods, which could do nothing. And they told him, cry unto your God. And then they say, well, who are you and where are you from? And what do you do for a job and all this kind of stuff? And he fesses up, I work for God. And I'm a Hebrew. I believe in the God that created the heaven and the earth. And he made this sea and everything in it. And then they figure out he's running from God. So he says, well, throw me overboard and it'll all go away. This is because of me. It's my fault. Uh, I've called Jonah a suicide soul winner. He had this bad attitude. I don't want to go to those people. Oh me, oh my, like Eeyore evangelism, right? Do we have to go to those people over there? Right? So he always had this bad attitude. So he goes, now in chapter 2 we would see that he's in the belly of the whale for these three days, down in the slime, the dead fish, and all the stomach acid. And he cries unto the Lord. He says, out of the belly of hell cried I. And it's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ that he would die, be buried for three days, and rise again. Chapter 3, he goes, and they actually change. The people of Nineveh hear the message, and they change. They get right with God Chapter 4, Jonah goes and sits outside of the city, and he waits, he's waiting to see if God's actually going to destroy him. He's still angry, and he still wants to see Nineveh destroyed. That's the whole story and the long and the short of it. Now, a few neat things in there is that the men on the boat, they called on the name of the Lord, and they made a sacrifice after he told them the truth, and they made some vows. That's kind of neat. If there's one word that could sum up the whole book, it's a story of repentance. Jonah repented. Jonah said, I'm not going. But then he changed his mind and he actually went. Now, God did give him a second chance. He was as good as dead. But God prepared a fish. You notice that in the last, one of the last verses there. He says in verse 17, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish. And remember that word prepared because we're going to see it at the end of the sermon. God prepared a fish Jonah was being punished with the fish, but he was also being saved by the fish. Sometimes God lets things happen in our life that's meant for correction, and it's grievous to us, and yet it's still showing God's mercy through it because that fish that was part of his punishment actually demonstrated the Lord's mercy and grace, and it saved his life and gave him another chance. Jonah's mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament as restoring the coasts of Israel, and then we get to this where it's kind of like uh, he's dead. Well, he's not dead. Well, he has a bad attitude. Well, so again, I want you to think of this word repentance, and we're going to deal with that tonight. I want to show you a few things. If you look at Jonah chapter 1, verse number 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Now listen, it's a big deal when that kind of wickedness gets to that kind of level, and it comes up to God's nose where he thinks it stinks. In fact, this reminds me of Genesis 18, where it says, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. The, the innocent children that were being hurt in Sodom and Gomorrah, their cry was coming up to God, and He sent some angels down to destroy it all, to torch them all. If you know the story of Genesis 18 and 19. So we're going to talk about how Jonah repented. Um, how he would obey, and he would go, and he would preach. Nineveh would listen, and they would actually repent. And then finally, I want to talk about how God would repent. So there's three thoughts here tonight. Jonah repented, Nineveh repented, and then God repented. And I want to talk about all three, what Jonah did repent of and what he did not repent of what Nineveh did repent of and what they did not repent of, and what God repented of and yet what he did not change his mind on. 
If you would, go with me to Matthew chapter 21. It's very important, first of all, if I'm going to use the word repent over and over in this sermon, I want to make sure that you don't have a preconceived idea of what you think it means. Today, there is a false gospel that's infiltrated Baptist churches. It's been influenced by Calvinists. It's called Lordship Salvation. They say you have to repent of your sins to be saved, although the Bible doesn't use that phrase anywhere, not one time, not at all. Now, as a born-again Christian, I'm going to preach to you, you need to repent of your sins, you need to get it right. However, to become a Christian, you do not have to turn from a specific sin to be saved. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. It's all by faith, not by works. And repent, the word repent means to change your mind. Change your mind. Uh, I don't really... I, I don't talk a lot about going back to the Greek in the Hebrew because most people that do that, they end up having a stumbling block or a crutch of whosoever's dictionary they're reading or whatever concordance they get it from or whoever they're quoting. And the problem is there are some concordances or dictionaries or languages that take a word and ascribe a new definition to it, but not the one that God intended. If you go back to the word repent in the New Testament, it's a word called metanoia. Has anybody ever had them use this word to you? More than one time I've had somebody say, yeah, but you have to have metanoia to be saved. Now, I don't like speaking a foreign language without interpretation. First Corinthians is very clear about that. I should not use foreign languages without interpreting it. The easiest way to understand what that word is, it's two words together. Meta, which means change, and noia means mind. A caterpillar has a metamorphosis. It changes its body. And somebody that's out of their mind, they're paranoia, right? So noia is mind, meta is change. The word itself in the simplest form means to change your mind. I am not saved by changing my lifestyle or stopping sin. I am saved when I realize I've not trusted in Christ and I change my mind about the Lord Jesus Christ and I put my trust in Him. Now the best place in the Bible to define repentance is right here in Matthew 21. If you'll look in Matthew 21, because first of all, we're going to talk what did they repent of and what did they not repent of. So what is repentance anyway? Let's deal with that. Uh, Matthew 21 Verse number 28, he says, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. Do you follow what happened? Afterward, he changes his mind and then he goes. So repent in the most simplest form means to change your mind. I'm going to ask you guys this question after the service. You better write it down. All right? Repent means to change your mind. You see it right here in context. In fact, the next son does the same thing, verse 30. And he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. So he repented and he did not go. He changed his mind. Verse 31, Whither of the twain of them did the will of his father? They say unto him, The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Now wait a minute, wait a minute. He's preaching to the religious crowd, the scribes and the Pharisees and the ones that knew the law, and he says, The harlots, that's a whore, and the publicans, that's the tax collectors. I mean, we're talking about the scum of the scum. And Jesus said, the worst people out here, they're going to go to heaven, not because they changed their sin, but because they changed their mind about Jesus. Many of the Jews, the Pharisees especially, rejected him as Messiah. Now look at verse number 32. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness... And ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. The Pharisees did not change their mind and believe Jesus. And for that reason alone, they end up in hell. 
I want you to understand that. Now, if you would, please go to Nahum. Now, if you hold a place in Jonah, which you're going to need to do tonight, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Nahum was written about 150 years after Jonah, and it was also addressed to Nineveh. So first of all, what is repentance? Well, it means to change your mind. In context of the gospel, change your mind, believe the gospel. Mark 1.15, it says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Acts 19 verse 4, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. So John the Baptist said, I'm baptizing you and I want you to change your mind and believe on the one that's coming after me, right? Acts 20, 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you'll change your mind about getting right with God, you'll find faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You call on the name of the Lord for salvation. You believe that he will save you. You believe he's paid for your salvation. Salvation is by changing your mind about Jesus in the simplest way, having faith in Him. So that's what repentance means here. Now, repentance means to change your mind. Oftentimes, there is something that may follow. I was driving north, I repented, and I started driving south. I was not inherently sinning by driving north, nor by turning around and going south. I want you to understand this because we're going to see with Nineveh that they repented after Jonah repented. Before I show you why Jonah had to repent, I think it's fair to ask the question, why did Jonah hate Nineveh? Or the word it uses is he was angry with them. Why was Jonah angry with Nineveh? And why was God angry with Nineveh? Because it also uses that word. God and Jonah were both angry with Nineveh. You're in Nahum, if you would look at verse number one. 1.1, one, one. the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite, God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger. Now this is important. He was going to destroy them in Jonah chapter 1, but he waited until Nahum. He waited 150 years. He gave them a chance to get it right. God is slow to anger, and yet justice will come. He says in verse 3, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind, and in the storm, and in the clouds are the dust of his feet. Uh, go to chapter 3 while you're in Nahum. So he's actually setting it up, and he gives us all the details here. Historically accurate account that that city of Nineveh, which sat on many waters, surrounded by waters, it, the walls fell down, it was overflown, a great storm came in. All these things happened. It was the hand of the Lord. God smashed the city and turned it upside down. Uh, an example, you know, when he, he says in, in Jonah that the city will be overthrown. If I was making you a birthday cake, and you think about it, I set a birthday cake here and I make it your favorite type of cake, and then we put your favorite type of icing, and we draw on it, and we put all the fancy stuff, and we put the candles, and then I take it and I overthrow it and I smash it down. Everything's upside down, broken, and destroyed. And that's literally, physically, what happened to that city when God was done with it. You're in Nahum chapter 3. Look at verse number 1. Verse number 1. Woe to the bloody city. It is full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. So the re this is the reason that God hated Nineveh, this is the reason that Jonah despised them and didn't want to go there. They're a bunch of liars, they're crooks, and when somebody goes in, they're like prey that never gets out. It's like a mouse that a cat has, and he's just toying with it, throwing it around until he ultimately destroys it. That's what happens to the people that end up in this city. They're ultimately destroyed. Um, look at verse 2. The noise of a whip, pa, right? And the noise of the rattling of the wheels, and the prancing horses, and of the jumping chariots. The horsemen lifteth up 
both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain, and a great number of carcasses, and there is none end of their corpses, they stumble upon their corpses. This city, historically speaking, it was at the peak of an Assyrian empire. It was at the peak of this Babylonian culture. There was a ton of perversion. There was a lot of human sacrifice. And there was a lot of slave trade. The history of this empire, this city, and this king that's being proclaimed against, it was unbelievable some of the things that they did. Things that should not be mentioned in public. If you look at verse number four, because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts, that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. You guys understand at this time of year when people are out celebrating Halloween, it is witchcraft. And some of the things they're doing, as it says here in Nahum 3, it is whoredoms, harlotry, it, a mistress of witchcraft. The Bible says you should not suffer a witch to live. Some of the things that happen in Halloween time, for instance, we were talking about it in the evening. Brother Ross brought this up as we were out talking uh, uh, with Brother Doug. Bobbing for apples, for instance. They would come up and take family members and they would boil water and put an apple in it and they would expect you to reach in with your face and get the apple. And if you lived, if you got the apple, you lived. The people that lived usually boiled out their eyeballs. They lost their sight, their nose, their smell, their tongue. This is Halloween. Do you understand why it's wicked and abominable and we should not participate nor support it? This witchcraft, you know, it says, if you look at verse 4, I want you to look at what the Bible says. Why God was angry with this city. It says in the second half of it, after it says the mistress, mistress of witchcraft, it says that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. This nation was known for kidnapping whole families and then splitting them up and hurting them in all manner of vile ways. That whole concept of trick or treat is where the pagans would come after the Christians and say, give us one of your children as a treat, or we're really going to do the whole family in. The whole trick-or-treat concept is wicked and abominable. Oh, I know, it's just for kids to play, to dress up like cowboys. That's not what it is. It's Satanism. It's conditioning. It's spiritual grooming to get your children to participate in Satanic activities. But here we see that Nineveh specifically, God was angry with them for kidnapping families and selling them into whoredoms. They had a slave trade that was world-renowned. Verse 5, Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face. I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdom thy shame. And I will cast abominable filth upon thee, and make thee vile, and will set thee as a gazing stock. God was proclaiming judgment. Now, if you would please go back to Jonah chapter 3. I think it's important that you understand why Jonah really despised the Ninevites, and why God was angry with them as well. In Jonah chapter 3, we're going to see here that Jonah repented of his disobedience, but he did not repent of his anger. If you would, look at verse number 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. It was so big it took three days to walk across it. 
Verse 4, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Here Jonah begins to proclaim the judgment of God. And he was angry. I want you to understand, Jonah was preaching out of an angry, bitter spirit. Uh, I imagine he was a bit of a gazing stock as he just spent three days in the whale's belly full of acid. Uh, perhaps it bleached his hair. He smelled like a dead fish. Perhaps some of them saw him spit out. I don't know. But it was obviously a sign to him. Jesus tells us that Jonah was a sign to that generation. And here he comes. And he's angry. He's preaching the Word of God. But he's not alone. I want you to understand something. When you preach the truth of the Word of God, God's invisible Holy Spirit is with you and working for you to prick their hearts. He will convince them. He will show them. So when Jonah came at them and he said, God's going to destroy your city, the Holy Spirit was working and putting them in fear. They believed it. They believed it because of God's Spirit. Go to Jonah chapter 4. Go to the next chapter. Jonah chapter 4. Verse number 1, it says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. So after he preaches and they get it right, then he's still angry. So he repented of his disobedience, but he did not repent of his bad attitude or his anger. Verse 4, look at it. It says, Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? What an interesting question, and I hope that it would resonate in your heart. The next time you get real angry about something, can you imagine God coming to you? Does it do you any good to get mad? Doest thou well to be angry? Now Jonah's response is kind of bad. So what happens is he goes and he sets up a booth, a little tent, and there's the sun. So God, it says, if you look at it in, in Jonah 4, it says that God prepares a gourd that comes up and makes this shade. And then God prepares a wind that comes and smites it. And God prepares a hot wind. So all of a sudden, Jonah was enjoying the shadow under this little weed that popped up overnight. But then God prepares a worm to eat it. And then he prepares the wind. He prepares the sun. And God took it away. Now Jonah gets really mad. Look at verse 9. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Now that's when you get real bitter. Is, get, is getting mad doing you any good? Then you like kick the tire and you hurt your toe. I am, yeah, I am mad and it's okay. And you start, you're just making the situation worse. That's why I call Jonah a suicidal soul winner. He was just digging it and digging it and digging it. Now God's teaching him a lesson here because God is kind and merciful he is long-suffering. He puts up with us for a while. He's drawing Jonah to teach him this lesson. Jonah, again, saying, I'd rather die. But God had pity on Jonah when he prepared the fish. You remember that? Then he prepared the gourd. Then he prepared the worm. And he prepared this wind. He was trying to teach Job something like, hey, Jonah, hey, I, I saved you with a whale. And don't get mad over the, the gourd. Why? Because God loves people and He loves life. Look at verse 9, or verse 10. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it to grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much cattle? So I'm reminding you here, this point is that Jonah repented of his disobedience, but he did not repent of his anger. And God was trying to teach him a lesson. He said, God says, hey, I love people and I was saving the people. Hey, hey, Jonah, you're mad over the gourd, but I saved you and you didn't deserve it. And then he goes on and he says, now look at the number that he says in your Bible. Look at the last verse. He says, six score thousand. Now a score is 20. 6 times 20 is 120, right? 120,000 people that cannot discern between their left hand and their right. Now, uh, I've got some volunteers here. Everybody raise your left hand. <laughs> Landon, which, Landon's got it. Okay. Uh, uh, Hosanna, would you please raise your left hand? I I'm teaching you a lesson here. What does this mean? 
God loves life, and He especially loves the life of children. There may have been millions of people in this city, and He let 90% of them live because He wanted to spare 120,000 children that didn't even know which one was left and which one was right. And much cattle. He made the cattle too. They don't have souls, but He made them. Think about the compassion of God in this situation. He's trying to teach jo Jonah, don't get mad over the gourd. I love those people. Jonah repented. He obeyed. He went to the people and preached, but he was still angry at them. Sometimes God wants us to reconcile with people or show love to people or even preach to people that we don't want in our church. God just tells us to go. This is a hard lesson. Are you telling me we need to invite all the weirdos in here? I didn't say that either now. There's balance in everything. But it's interesting how God spared all of them for the sake of the children. He wanted to save the children. Go back one chapter, go to Jonah 3. Now I want to talk about Nineveh itself. Nineveh repented of their violence, but Nineveh did not repent of their unbelief. I would like to believe that some of the people in Nineveh got saved at the preaching of Jonah, but the Scriptures make it clear not all of them did. I want to show you this. In Nineveh chapter 3, look at verse number 4. And Jonah began to enter into a city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Now, when I see verse 5, I'm optimistic because I know salvation is just by believing God and believing His promise and His record. And I would like to think that at this point that Jonah was not only preaching the doom and gloom, but he was also preaching the hope of salvation by God's covenant. I, I would like to believe that, although the Scriptures don't clearly tell us that at all. I would like to believe some of them believed just as some of the, the mariners that were on the ship when they believed in the one true God. Uh, I would like to think some got saved here. Uh, look at verse 6. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. So he humbles himself before the Lord. He's fasting and showing, hey, I'm scared of God. Verse 7. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. That's a big deal when the whole government comes down on you and they say, Don't drink anything. Don't eat anything. Don't let your animals eat. Don't let your children eat. God is going to kill us. The fear of the Lord was in the camp. The Holy Spirit was probably convicting them. And they believed that it was, uh, their time was up. And within 40 days they would have been gone. Verse 8. Here's the proclamation. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Now, this is kind of like uh, the revival that we all wished would happen. Wouldn't it be amazing in America if they kicked out all the crooked politicians and then some Christians got in, and I mean real Christians, not just the ones that give it lip service or put it as a Facebook status, and they got up there and they said, listen, every man and woman needs to cry out to God right now. God's going to destroy us. He's going to annihilate us. You need to stop the abortion. You need to stop the sodomy. You need to stop the robbery. You need to get rid of those video games of destruction. Get rid of the violence. Get rid of the perversion. It's time to clean things up. Don't eat any food. And I want everyone to cry out to God and yell and beg for His mercy. And the whole nation obeyed the king here. They were crying out asking for mercy. Wouldn't that be awesome if something like that happened in America? What did they say? Look at verse 9. Who can tell if... God will turn and repent and turn away from His fierce anger that we perish not. Verse 10, And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that He has said He would do unto them, and He did it not. First of all, you have to understand evil means harm. 
I gave the example last week of health or harm, good and evil, right? Uh, God will do evil to the wicked people. And that's what he was about to do. He said, you people are wicked and violent. You're hurting the innocent. I'm going to hurt you bad. I'm going to destroy you completely. Well, God changed his mind about hurting them. Why? Because they changed their mind. Now, here's the key. Here's the point. Nineveh repented of their violence, but they did not all repent of their unbelief. Some of them, they were afraid and they just checked the box and said, I'll quit doing that, I'll quit doing that. I see God's about to kill us. And God spared this generation and probably saved thousands and thousands of lives. But I want you to notice that when you turn from your evil way, when you repent of your sins, God calls that works. Look at it in verse 10. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that He said He would do unto them, and He did it not. If you would, go to Matthew chapter 12. Go to Matthew chapter number 12. God is merciful and patient. God spares their lives because they did what He said. God said, stop or I'll destroy you. So they obeyed. They stopped. And God did not destroy them. That does not automatically mean they were all saved. Again, I would like to think that when some of them believed God, they believed the gospel, and that we'll see some of them up there. When you get to Matthew 12, please find verse number 38. Matthew 12, verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. So this is interesting. The scribes and the Pharisees come to Jesus. Show us a sign. He says, You are wicked and adulterous. He called them out for what they were. And he says, And you're looking for a sign. I'll give you a sign. It's what happened with Jonah, where he was seemingly dead for three days, and he came back to life. And he was speaking of himself, how the Lord Jesus Christ would go into the grave for three days. Uh, look at verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh, this is important, pay attention to 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Now wait a minute. What generation? Well, that evil and adulterous generation. The scribes and the Pharisees that were unsaved. He said the resurrection... In the resurrection, the men of Nineveh will be there. Now, there's a problem here. These are people that are not saved. I want you to understand. There is a resurrection before the millennial kingdom of Christ. We which are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord. Right? So when we, at the, when we see the Lord coming, we shall not prevent them which are asleep. Uh, we, we will be caught up together in the clouds. Right? So there is a resurrection of the just... But then also there's a resurrection of judgment. And that happens over a thousand years later. And at this resurrection, that's when the men of Nineveh come up out of the grave. That means they're not saved. They're going to rise at the same time as the Pharisees. And they're going to say, we believed and we turned from our evil. We repented of our evil. We listened to the preacher. And they're going to condemn the Pharisees that didn't listen to the preaching of Jesus. Look at this verse in whole, verse 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. If you would, go back to Nahum, verse number 1. And I'd like to finish with this. Listen, so Jonah repented of his disobedience, and he went and preached. But Jonah did not change his mind about his anger. He didn't repent of that. He still had that problem. Now, Nineveh repented of their evil works, their violence. But Nineveh did not change their mind about believing the gospel and get saved. Finally, God repented of destroying them. 
God did not destroy them as He said He would. He repented of His anger and He spared that generation because they stopped hurting the innocent. However, God did not change His mind ultimately about the judgment that was due. In Jonah 3, if you remember, he says, Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from His fierce anger that we perish not? And He did that, and they didn't die. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that He had said He would do unto them. And He did it not. Now you're in Nahum, and I want to end with this. Look at verse number 6. Who can stand before His indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of His anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by Him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knoweth them that trust in Him. It's neat. God knows your heart. He knows if you're saved. He knows if you're really believing in Him. But there's this message of repentance that needs to be preached. We preach change your mind and believe on Jesus and be saved, and then come to church and we're going to tell you change your lifestyle and get a blessing from God. If you don't change your lifestyle, then God's going to correct you. It's interesting that the men of Nineveh, they cleaned up their life and they turned from their sin, and yet many of them still went to hell. I do think it's important as Bible-believing Christians that we preach to this wicked generation, you need to cease from your sin. But if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will end up in hell. Even Christians, you say, well, I'm saved, I'm good, I don't have to worry about any of it. Well, there is a sin unto death, fornication, adultery, lasciviousness. There are certain sins that when God shows to you and He convicts you and you say, ah, I'm not interested, and you grieve the Holy Spirit, God may just bring you home early. God will kill His children for continued sin. And that applies to the lost also. I just wonder about this situation with Jonah. He spared a million to save 120,000 children. One time, someone gave me the example. They said that they were raised in a household where their dad was an abusive drunk. He would get mad and yell, and he would throw a tantrum and you know throw things against the wall and that kind of thing. And they asked me, like, Pastor Fannin, why did God let me live in that situation? Well, that father had free will. The mother was saved. But I used the example. It came to me. I said, well, let me ask you this. What if God killed your father just because he was a drunk and he would hit his kids? But then the uncle was a homo, a sodomite, a pervert, a child abuser. Maybe God allowed you to uh, be safe in a house where there's yelling and drunkenness and, and that kind of abuse, but He protected you from a darker evil. And we can't blame God for what men choose to do ultimately. This message is Jonah repented, then Nineveh repented, and then God repented. Jonah didn't repent of everything. Nineveh didn't repent of everything. And God did not change His mind about eternal judgment. Just because you turn from your sin in this life, if you die without the Lord Jesus Christ, you will burn in hell. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that You would help us to consider this. And Lord, I ask that You would help us to get close to You and have a good relationship with You. Lord, I pray that You would help us to keep a short account with You and deal with our sins quickly to please You. Lord, we're very thankful for the gift of salvation. And we're very thankful for how You handle us in mercy. Lord, I pray that You would fill our mouth with Your Word and go out and teach repentance by believing on You. And Lord, I pray that You would help us to turn this generation around. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.